Thank you all. Thank you all very much. God bless you, and thanks for hanging in to the end here. Um, first of all, let me say, Tony gave me a very strong warning about what I could say and what I couldn't say up here today. I, you know, I still have the language of a soldier occasionally, but that wasn't what he was worried about. What he was worried about was that I'd use some big word that he had no idea what it meant. And then he would be embarrassed because he'd be looking it up on his iPad. So I am going to refrain from doing that. But he is a Marine, so just give me the high sign, Tony, if I need to repeat something. And I'll talk real <laughs> slow just so you can understand, okay? I can't help it. How many other Marines we got out here? I just heard the Marine Corps mating call out there. Who was that? Somebody, there's another, there's a Marine over there. There's another one. Yeah, I could tell. The, the, the neck and head seem to be meshed together. All right. So, by the way, this Marine, Marines are kind of ingenious sometimes, and they show a lot of ingenuity. So this Marine was checking into Camp Lejeune Marine, uh, Air, uh, Marine uh, Base and down in eastern North Carolina, down where I grew up, and he got in there real late into the little town of Jacksonville and he went to this little flea bag hotel and he said, I need a room. And they said, well, there's, we've had such an influx of people, there's not a room left. He said, look, I'll sleep anywhere. It doesn't matter. Just give me a room. Give me a bed. Just give me a bed. That's all I need. The guy proprietor there in the hotel said, well, I tell you what, he said, we do have a room over there with two beds. Uh, there's already a Navy chief in the other bed, but he said, uh, and he'd probably be willing to split the cost with you. So he said, why don't you go over there? And he said, I'll be glad to. He said, now there is a problem. He said, what's the problem? He said, this guy snores so loud that it's unlikely that you're going to get any sleep. He said, no, don't worry about it. He went over there, came out the next morning in a fresh uniform, looking good. And the proprietor of the hotel there said, hey, you look pretty good. You must have slept well. He said, I slept like a log. He said, well, the snoring didn't bother you? He said, I corrected that in 60 seconds. He said, well, what'd you do? He said, when I got in the room there, I went over, bent down, kissed him on the cheek and said, good night, sweetheart. And he said, he sat up all night watching me. <laughs> I got some more too. Can I suggest we've talked, we've done a lot of talking about this book. Pastor Conlon, I think that uh, what you said was absolutely so important for this time. We talked about this book. Right. And the importance of knowing what's in this book, of reading this book, of making, making this a personal uh, objective to understand it. But could I suggest that we also need to focus on this? That is not a Bible. You know what that is? That's the Constitution of the United States. You see, this came from this. And too many people, even Christians, who know what's in this book, do not know what's in this. Folks, we are fighting not only for this, but we're fighting for this. And may I suggest that we need to know what's in both of them. And we need to spend time because you see, for 36 and a half years, this was my transcendent cause. This was my raison d'etre, my reason to be, my reason to exist. 36 and a half years, I fought for this constitution, which came from this book by men who believed the word of God, by men who loved our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, in 19... 80, 93, and many of you know I was a commander of the Delta Force in Mogadishu during the events that we know right now as Black Hawk Down. And I, uh, I was wounded there. I lost 16 men, and there were 75 of us wounded to include me. And the man that I was standing next to when I got hit died. I was standing this close to him. He died and I lived. He died. I looked down when I got to my feet and came to and looked down. He was laying on the ground dead and I said, why God? 
Why not me? He's got young children. Why not me, God? And I pondered that statement for years. And I've never told Tony Perkins this. But what I'm revealing to him today may be something that will surprise him. But I pondered that question, why me? Why did you spare me, God? Until the 15th of August of 2012 when Floyd Lee Corkins walked in our lobby and shot Leo Johnson and intended to kill Tony Perkins and me and as many people in that building as he could. And the Spirit of the Lord said, I spared you to fight another day. I spared you to be a warrior in my kingdom. For such a time as this. Pastor, spiritual leader, ministry leader, you've been spared for such a time as this. You've been spared to fight another day, whether it's been physical, financial, family, no matter what it is, you've been spared to fight. And I'm here today to tell you we're going into battle. We're going. We are going into battle, but I'm not here to tell you it's going to be easy. That's not my purpose here today. I'm not here to tell you there won't be casualties because there will. There will be casualties, but we're going into battle. I want to show you something because I want you to be prepared. You saw a snippet of it. But I want you to understand as I show you this, just a short portion of this video here, I want you to understand that Tony was asked to come to New York and to go on CNN with Bob Schieffer, and he was told that he would be on set debating a rabid homosexual LGBT advocate, that the two of them with Bob Schieffer to moderate would have a debate. And when he got there, Bob Schieffer said, no, we're going we're gonna to just do you, and then we'll have him come on the program later after you're off. That's when he knew that he, had, he was about to be ambushed, but he didn't know how vitriolic and nasty Bob Schieffer was going to be. And I want you to look at this and understand this is what you're preparing for, every one of you. This is what you're preparing for is this kind of thing. Play the video. Probably the most vocal opponent of uh, same-sex marriage, and that is Tony Perkins. He is the uh, president of the Family Research Council. And, Ms. Perkins, I'm going to say this to you up front. You and your group have been so strong in coming out against this and against gay marriage that the Southern Poverty Law Center has branded the Family Research Council an anti-gay hate group. We have been inundated by people who say we should not even let you appear because they, in their view, quote, you don't speak for Christians. Do you think you have taken this too far? No, Bob, we stand, well, first of all, let me say thank you for allowing us to continue to have this discussion because I think it's a discussion that's going to continue on regardless of what the court says. The court is not going to settle this issue. In fact, I think it does a disservice to both sides if the court uh, weighs in on public policy like this. The courts are decided to inter interpret the Constitution and the constitutionality of laws, not create public policy. When they do that, uh, they create division and they erect barriers to reaching consensus on uh, on uh, public policy like this. And so, no, we we stand with millennia of experience that the union of a man and woman, the sacred union of marriage, is the cornerstone of society. Now I want you to, I want to say this to you. First of all, Tony, uh, Bob Schieffer is lucky that Tony didn't take his head off right there. I know he's a Christian. He's, a, he's an ordained minister. You know what? If it had been me, I don't know whether I, I would have been able to be as professional as Tony was. That's what you're preparing for, though. You, how would you like to be humiliated to the entire country? on a single program. Well, let me tell you, first of all, Bob Schieffer's gone now. Look, the Christian community came out against us. You see, when we uh, came out in support of us, they came out and, and supported us. In fact, Schieffer wound up trying to call him to issue an apology, and he's told his director of communications, you tell him, unless he's gonna make a public a policy, I'm not talking to him. Amen. But look. Let me tell you something, that we, that we sent letters out to all the sponsors of the program and everything else. When we fight back, we win. 
That's what we got to understand, and we've got to accept when we fight back, we win. You see, he was in San Jose, California last May, and the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the most evil groups in America, Amen. came out against him, wanted to stop him from speaking at the, in San Jose at a community prayer breakfast there, and they just came out vitriotically against him. And there's a pastor in a Calvary chapel out there named Bob Grenier. And Bob said, no, come on. Come on. We're going to have this prayer breakfast. Bob's a warrior. Bob's a tough guy. God's, he's one of us. And they had that thing. And when it was over, because they couldn't get Tony Perkins, they went after the sheriff. Because the sheriff showed up and brought several of his deputies. And he was in uniform for this prayer breakfast by this guy that was from a hate group. Well, Tony told us, you do everything we have to do to help that sheriff. I got on the phone with the reporters out there and told them exactly what the Southern Poverty Law Center was and who they were. And then we turned two of our staff people over to them and said, give them all the information that you've got. Give them everything they need out there. And I just told Tony the other day, we got a text from the sheriff out there, Sheriff Boudreaux. It sounded like he from the, the, the bio, huh? Yeah. Sheriff Boudreaux. He said, praise the Lord. He said, not only did we win this thing, but he said, now the people of San Jose want me to go to every prayer breakfast in uniform. Can you believe that? When we fight, we win. We win. The problem is we got too many people that won't fight. We're going into battle. You see, we're surrounded. People have asked me, how do you reconcile your personal faith with being a soldier? I say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And they say, well, you know, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. And I say two things here. Number one, you don't have a clue what the Bible actually says. Right. <laughs> Number two, if you really believe that, then you believe that somewhere between Mount Sinai and the Jordan River, when he told them cross that river and kill them all, that God changed his mind. Is that what you believe? Well, I, well, I never thought about it that way. No. You see, warfare is a constant state for mankind. There's always been war. There will always be war. Right. But as Christians, we know that we are in a spiritual battle every day. And the problem in America is most of the church doesn't teach the realities of the spiritual battles that we're in. They don't teach about spiritual warfare. They don't teach about the fact that Peter says, our enemy, right. our adversary, right. Satan, prowleth around like a roaring lion looking for whom he might devour. Satan is real. Amen. And we're in a constant state of warfare. The problem is too many people inside the church, both leaders and parishioners, want to compromise. They want to surrender. They want to just take the easy way out. Folks, we're going, in this room, we're going into battle. And it's going to be a tough battle. But when we fight, we win. Right, Steve? Right. See, we got some warriors in here. Steve is one of them. Brother Harry Jackson, Carter Conlon. Where's Mark Coward? Mark Coward was here yesterday. I caught a glimpse of him out in, Calif uh, out in Colorado. There's a warrior back there. And how about Charles Flowers and old Rick Scarborough, that knucklehead. He slipped out on me, but it doesn't matter. That's a tough guy. There's Rick Scarborough. These are men who have already made this decision long ago, no matter what the cost. I'm going into battle. I'm stepping into battle because, you know, somebody, I don't know who wrote it. Nobody does. It's, it's anonymous. But there's actually a saying in the military, and it is so appropriate for today. It says the soldier fights not because he hates what's ahead of him. He fights because he loves what's behind him. What do we fight for? What do you care about? What's behind you? Let me tell you what's behind me, six grandchildren. I got six grandchildren behind me. I was down in Tidewater, Virginia this weekend watching my three, one six-year-old and two five-years-old in a wrestling tournament. And I stood and watched those boys and I thought, what a blessing. And they got three sisters above them. My six grandchildren, that's what I fight for. That's what's behind me. And if you don't recognize that you've got something behind you that's worth fighting for, yeah. that's right. then you might as well not even try. 
The soldier fights not because he hates what's ahead of him. He fights because he loves what's behind him. And it's time that we start thinking about what's behind us and stop being selfish as a church and being willing to step into battle. Folks, we're going into battle and it is not going to be easy, but we will be victorious. Warfare is constant. And it just surprises me at the number of people are just compromising. Now the Supreme Court has made this decision and even before, so many in the leadership in the church today are compromising and they do it like this. They say, well, uh, God has revealed to me. Revealed to you? Uh, Let me tell you what he's revealed to me. He's revealed to me that you're a fool. God has revealed to me, you say. All of you for thousands of years you've been wrong and God has now revealed to me how we need to deal with this issue and it's acceptable biblically oh that was Old Testament we don't want to hear about that but God's new covenant what you got to be kidding me God's revealed nothing to you but it's the easy way out and why is that because they don't want to fight because they're not warriors because they don't have the courage to stand and fight Isaiah 5 says Woe unto you who call good evil and evil good, who call darkness light and light darkness and bitter sweet and sweet bitter. And that's exactly what these people that have suddenly had these revelations are doing is calling evil good. And it's evil and woe is a warning. And we had better heed that warning because there's a price to pay if we do not. And by the way, we're paying that price right now because we've not heeded that warning. And that's what's happening to our society and to our families across this country. Our family structure is falling apart because we haven't heeded that warning. We've aborted 60 million babies. And now we're selling the body parts to those babies. And you think that America can get by with that and not pay a price? And we call it good. We call it choice. It's murder. It's evil. It's evil beyond murder. Selling body parts, keeping body parts to sell on the open market. We're called to be warriors. Psalm 94 says, And who will take a stand against these evil doers for me? Who will rise up? That's not talking to the heathens. It's not talking to secular America. It's talking to you. It's talking to the church. It's talking to us, me and you. We're called to be warriors. Exodus 15, 3 said the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And Revelation 19 says when Jesus comes back, he's coming back as a warrior. I see the vivid image of him coming riding a white horse, wearing a blood-stained white robe, leading a mighty army with a sword coming out of his mouth to destroy his enemies. And let me tell you something. You theologians can tell me that blood on his robe is the blood he shed at Calvary, but I choose to believe that's the blood of his enemies because he's coming back as a warrior. He's coming back to slay those that have stood against him and his kingdom. He's coming back as a mighty warrior to do battle. And I got in big trouble one time for saying that sword coming out of his mouth because of the change in technology is probably an AR-15. And they went, they went after me. I got a cartoon in my office that appeared in some Huffington Post or something. But he's coming back as a warrior. Don't you think that we're supposed to be warriors in his kingdom? Folks, let me tell you something. We are surrounded by the enemy. We are surrounded by the enemy. And so many in our ranks are giving up and surrendering. And they'd rather quit and surrender than to stand and fight than to lead into battle. Not me, not Tony Perkins, not the Family Research Council. I stay there because I know where he stands. I know he's never going to compromise. I know he's going to, if there's nobody else standing, if nobody else is standing, he's going to stand. He's going to be there till the end. And the Bible is very clear about that, that those who stand to the end will receive their reward. Got to have a transcendent cause. The soldier doesn't fight because he hates what's in front of him. He fights because he loves what's behind him. What do you care about? What matters to you? You got to have a transcendent cause. My latest book I wrote with uh, 
Many of you will remember Dr. Stu Weber from Portland, Oregon, remember him from the Promise Keepers movement, and he wrote a marvelous book, probably the best book ever written for men, a book called Tender Warriors. And he and I wrote a book we released in December called The Warrior Soul, and, and the whole idea behind our book was to get people to understand what a warrior really is, and it's not the biggest and the baddest with all the magazines hanging off of them and the grenades and everything. It's the person that in their heart they have a transcendent cause and they know what they're willing to live for. They know what they're willing to sacrifice for, what they're willing to serve for, and ultimately what they're willing to die for. I do not want to die for my faith. I don't want to die for my country. That's not the question. And the question was asked earlier, and I think, Carter, it was you. Am I willing to? Am I willing to? That's the real question. Am I willing to do that? What's your transcendent cause? You know, we got to have leadership today. We have to have leadership in this church. The church is the most important entity right now in changing America. Amen. But it's going to take leadership. And remember that the most important characteristic and quality of a leader is courage. It's been talked about all through this conference. But his courage, go back to Joshua 1.6 when the Lord said to him in the very first book of Joshua, he said, be strong and courageous. He even repeated it in the very next sentence. He said, be strong and very courageous. Courage. How important. Remember in Deuteronomy 20 verse 8, Moses was instructing the people how they were to live a godly life and what they were to do in different situations and circumstances. He said, when you go to war, you bring the priest forward and the priest shall say to the people, be courageous. And then he said, and the officers, in verse 8, the officers will come forward and address the people and the officers will say, is any man afraid? If he is, go home. Because you may scare the others. Go home. There's no place in battle for cowards. For those of you who were at the Watchman Summit in May, I did a presentation called Lessons from the Infantry. And one of those lessons is never take a coward into combat. He's going to fail you. He's going to be even worse in combat than he is in garrison. Yep. When you know he's a coward, don't take him into combat. Right. And that's what Deuteronomy is talking about. Is any man afraid? Let him go home. Or if you stay, you might frighten your brothers. We've got to have courage. It's fundamental to success in battle. And remember that courage is not the absence of fear. It's overcoming fear. You know, I made over 500 parachute jumps. I was telling Tony about this last night. And only, only the laundry knows how scared I was on every one of those 500. <laughs> Can I say that? I'm okay. Am I going to get counseled? We'll get a counseling statement when this is over. Yeah, there it is. He's already writing on it. I was scared on every one of them. It's not the absence of fear. It's overcoming fear. In fact, you know, it's kind of interesting that uh, Patton said this. George Patton, maybe one of the greatest generals in, in our American history. He said, courage is fear holding on a minute longer. Think about that. Courage is fear holding on a minute longer. Great heroes that have had very high decorations for valor were scared. But it didn't stop them from doing what had to be done. Patton also said, and listen to this. I want you to think, because this applies to every one of us in here. This is what we need to think about. Patton said, moral courage is the most valuable and usually the most absent characteristic in men. Moral courage. You know what moral courage is? Moral courage is the, more, is the courage to stand up and say, no, homosexuality is inconsistent with the teachings of the Bible when you're a prominent pastor when you're a spiritual leader, when you're the president of the Family Research Council. That is moral courage. Yeah, at some point when people come in your lobby trying to kill you, it becomes an issue of physical courage, but it's moral courage. 
How many of our politicians today have moral courage to stand up and do exactly what they say they will do? Let me tell you, you got one in Texas. And I'm not advocating for anybody, but I'll just tell you that Ted Cruz is one of those people that, that has made promises and then stood up and, and done what he said people would. That's moral courage. I use it as an example of moral courage. We've got to have that courage in the church. We've got to have that among pastors. Moral courage. It'll stand up and be counted. It'll take a stand. We're going into battle, folks. And it's not going to be easy. Prepare yourselves. And the most important thing is courage. You know, David Hackworth, who wrote the book About Face, a... Uh, Soldier during the Korean War as well as the Vietnam War, this is what he said. Courage is being the only one on the battlefield who knows that you're afraid. That's exactly how I feel. I've never been into battle that I didn't have fear. But you overcome that fear to demonstrate courage. It's very important. Remember, we're surrounded by the enemy. We've got to break out of this. We've got to break out and, and be victorious. Remember that God's army is much larger than the army of the enemy. In fact, remember in 2 Kings 6, verses 16 and 17, when Elisha and his servant were surrounded and his servant woke up one morning and looked out on the hillsides and he, he said, oh, Lord, look, look at this army. What are we going to do? He was so afraid he trembled in fear and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open my servant's eyes that he might see that the army fighting for us is greater than the army fighting against us. And when he opened that servant's eyes, there were chariots of fire on the hillside. You know what? When we're in the thick of battle, it's hard for us to remember that God's army is mightier, it's greater. We either trust God or we don't. We, I've learned so much, and I, I hate complimenting a Marine, but I've learned so much from Tony <laughs> about stepping out in faith, about just simply stepping out in faith, knowing that God has promised that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, and knowing that his army is bigger. Right. Stepping out in faith. Amen. I've seen him step out in faith more than once, and let me tell you, it's encouraging and inspirational to me to see him and others there and the Family Research Council step out in faith. We didn't have any money for this event. But Knucklehead said, we're going to do it. I'm sorry, I can't call my boss Knucklehead. He said, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And I ain't going to tell you what this thing costs, but he said, we're going to do it. Well, of course, you know, you got the guy with the green eye shade sitting down at the other end of the table saying, well, we don't have any money for it. I don't. We're going to do it. He stepped out in faith to have this event. And I've got to tell you, it's the most powerful Family Research Council event that I've been to in my five years of association and three years of being his executive vice president. Because he stepped out in faith. No, he didn't have the money. He didn't know where it was coming from, but he knew it was coming. Carter, it's, it's like what you talked about, that the Lord showed you that something was coming, and we got to step out in faith and believe that God has spoken to us. We've got to step out in faith and demonstrate our courage and our trust, and we either believe the Bible or we don't. That's right. You know, courage is in very short supply in America today. We're surrounded by the enemy. So what do you do when you're surrounded? Well, you step out in faith. You don't surrender. That's what too much of the church is doing. That's what all these people that have had these great revelations are doing. They're surrendering. How about the 22nd of December, 1944, when the 101st Airborne Division was surrounded in a little town called Bastogne in Belgium? And there was a rather small man there named... 
Tony McAuliffe, a brigadier general who never should have been there, by the way. He was the assistant division commander of the 101st Airborne Division. He was in Paris with the division when the Bastogne was attacked. His division commander was in England at a conference, Maxwell Taylor. And McAuliffe was sent to take the 101st Airborne up into the Ardennes Forest there, and he wound up in Bastogne by mistake. He actually got lost and wound up in Bastogne. And, and he and the entire 101st were surrounded there, and there was no way out. They were surrounded. And the German commander sent four runners with a note for Tony McAuliffe. And in part, and I'll only read a portion of it, this is what the German commander said to Tony McAuliffe as he had him surrounded there, and he had superior forces by a factor of at least four, if not five or six. And he said, there is only one possibility to save the encircled American troops from total annihilation. And that is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. You know the reply. <laughs> you know his reply. Nuts! Nuts! He sent him a one-word reply. You can find it on the internet. You can find the actual, they still have it on the internet. Nuts! The German courier said, nuts? Yeah, I speak English. Nuts? Pardon me. May cost me my job. But he said, what does it mean? McAuliffe said, he said it means go to hell. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. nuts. He wasn't about to surrender. He wasn't about to surrender. And they won that battle because that little artilleryman that was the deputy commanding general of an infantry division never should have been there stayed and fought and they defeated a far superior force and that was the, superior, that was the most Important battle of World War II. From that point on, the war was won. That's where we need to be, folks. Right. We need to say nuts. We're fighting until the end. <laughs> when things get bogged down, when we get surrendered, when we're in a tough situation, it's the leader that's got to step forward. You've got to step out. Yeah. Yeah. The infantry school's motto is follow me. All over Fort Benning, if you've ever been there, all over Fort Benning. The infantry school motto is up very prominently, follow me. Well, where it came from was in October 1942 at a place called Leyte Island where MacArthur had returned to the Philippines and this was the initial invasion into the Philippines and the 34th Infantry Regiment was commanded by a man named Aubrey S. Newman, a colonel in the army and they landed on the beach there with the 34th Infantry regiment and they got bogged down. Japanese snipers and Japanese artillery and armor and mortars and machine guns were strafing the beach and killing his men. Aubrey S. Newman realizing that he was the leader that had to do something. He jumped up in the middle of this hail of bullets and yelled to his men, get off the beach. Get moving and follow me. And he led his men off that beach to overcome the Japanese positions and ultimately to take the island. The leader, he wasn't willing to just lay there and be killed or so much of the church today is just willing to just let the enemy roll right over us, have their way. Famous Marine, the probably the most famous Marine in the history of the U.S. Marine Corps, Chesty Puller. He was surrounded at the Chosun Reservoir. In fact, the Army thought that he had been annihilated. He and all his regiment had been annihilated, and they started pulling back to the coast, and Chesty Puller made this statement. All right, they're on our left. They're on our right. They're in front of us. They're behind us. They can't get away this time.
You know, folks, the next generation is going to remember us as either heroes for saving their freedoms or as cowards for sacrificing it at the altar of political correctness. Which is it going to be? We're going to be heroes to the next generation or are we going to be known as cowards because we've sacrificed their future? Step up. Demonstrate courage and stand against evil. Never surrender. No steps backward. The night of the 24th of April, 1980, I was standing in a remote desert location 100 miles from Tehran, Iran, as we were sent in by President Jimmy Carter to rescue 52 Americans who were being held by the Ayatollah Khomeini. And as we landed 100 miles from Tehran in the dark of the night in a remote part of the desert, and we brought helicopters in to refuel those helicopters as I was walking towards one of the C-130s that was actually doing the refueling one of the helicopters lifted off and tried to reposition and in the dark and the dust he, he went vertigo and it crashed into the C-130 and it exploded into a huge fireball. There were 45 of my Delta men inside that burning wreckage and they had no way out. The crew chief ran to the back door, the rack troop door, reached down the crew chief that had been doing this for years and he couldn't open the door. He couldn't get it open, and the men were starting to panic. The flames were leaping at them. In fact, some of them, the load-bearing equipment, their nylon load-bearing equipment was starting to melt. The flames were so intense. He couldn't get it open, and all of a sudden, a hand grabbed him on the shoulder and threw him out of the way. And that hand belonged to a big Yaqui Indian from Yuma, Arizona, a man named David Cheney. 240 pounds of him. He threw that man out of the way. He reached down and he grabbed that troop door and he twisted it and he popped it open and then he said, stand by men, don't panic, don't panic. We're getting out of here. Come on, let's go one at a time, one at a time. He stood by the door as they jumped out that burning C-130. And when the last man cleared, he went out behind. That's leadership. That's leadership. He let them out. Of, Will you be the one that pops that door? Will you be the one that leads your flock, your community, your city, your state through this fire? Will you be the one? God's called you for such a time as this. No matter the cost, your ultimate accountability is not to the newspapers or anybody in your community, you know where that accountability is going to be. And those people that have suddenly had a great revelation are going to be accountable for what they've done to confuse the people in this country, to confuse people that are right on the edge of turning their lives over to Christ yes. and getting out of an aberrant lifestyle. They're going to be accountable for that. I don't judge them. God will. What are you doing? Will you be the one that steps forward and pops that door and leads them out of there? Out into freedom. And finally, many of you have heard me tell this story before, but I'm going to tell you again for a reason. This prayer we had here was powerful. You can feel the power of the Holy Spirit, Harry. As you were praying, you could feel God's... And I heard people up here weeping at the altar. Who said it yesterday? All revivals have been preceded by an attitude of repentance yes. and prayer. Yes, Lord. We're going into battle. we got to start by preparing on our knees. Amen. When I got hit in Mogadishu... I went down, and when I finally came to and got on my feet, wobbly legs, having been hit in both legs by a mortar, I began to yell, find the doctor, and I didn't realize it, but he was laying right next to me. He'd been hit in the femoral artery by a piece of shrapnel right in the, right in the groin. 
the medics came running over, picked me up on a stretcher, picked him up on a stretcher, and ran us into a little reserve tent of, of Air Force Mobile Army Surgical Unit and laid us side by side on, his, on the ground. I reached over and took his hand, and I squeezed his hand, and I said, Rob, hold on, buddy. You're going to make it now. They put a blood pressure machine on him. They put a heart monitor on him. He was dying. He was bleeding out. He was going fast, and I watched as it was ticking away, ticking away, ticking away, ticking away. I prayed, God, don't let him die. God, don't let him die. Kept ticking away. God, don't let him die. I said, Rob, hold on. Hold on, buddy. Hold on, God, don't let him die. And all of a sudden, he opened his eyes and he just turned his head and he looked over at me. He said, he said tell Barbara that I love her. And his eyes closed and he, he was gone. I looked at the machine and I, I saw that he had no pulse and he had no blood pressure. He was gone. No, I said, God, don't let him die. I said, God, can you just spare this one? Can you just spare this one, God? Let him go, said the nurse. He's gone, sir. Put her hand on my shoulder. She said, sir, he's gone. Let him go. I couldn't let him go. Hold on. No, God. I could see there was no blood pressure. I could see there was no pulse. But I didn't accept that as being final. No, God. Don't let him die. She said, let him go, sir. He's gone. She reached down, took my hand, took his hand, tried to pull him apart. Let him go, sir. He's gone. I kept praying. God, in the name of Jesus, don't let him die. God, spare this one. Don't let this country go. Don't let this country go. Believe that we work, we, we, we serve a miracle working God. We serve a God that still raises the dead because that man is alive today. That man in 2014 was actually awarded the award for being the best doctor in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia last year. He's alive. He, he's alive. Don't get weary. Don't give up on battle. Go into battle knowing and believing that God is with us. Go into battle knowing that God is going to be right there. He's going to guide and control you. Stand boldly with the courage that God has given you yes, Lord. and fight until we see victory and we will yes. would you stand with me Father I thank you for every man and woman that has come to this conference Lord for you made the way for them to come here, Lord. You appointed them to be at this conference here to, God, to hear what has been said in this conference for the last two days. It is by divine appointment, Lord, that they are here, and we thank you, God, right, Lord. that you sent them, Lord. And now I ask you, Lord, to imbue in them, to, 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 to just give them a, a level of courage, God, that they didn't even know they had themselves. I ask you to give them night vision, God, that they, they don't even understand, Lord, because in that night vision, they can see the enemy. In that night vision, they can see the enemy. They can see his tricks. They can see what he's trying to do to destroy them and their ministries and to destroy our cities and our communities and our, our whole nation, God. And I just pray now, Lord, that you would give us the weapons of warfare, God, to defeat our enemies. Lord, help us to love those, God, who come against us, God, but give us the wisdom and the strength and the discernment and the weapons, God, to bring them down. To, God, to bring them down and to be victorious over them, God. Help us to reap a mighty harvest, Lord, and 
in our ministries, in our individual ministries, and collectively, God, and bring unity. Now bring unity, Lord, among us, regardless of our denomination, regardless of our race, regardless of our economic status, Lord, bring unity among us. And Lord, let every one of these men and women be leaders in their homes first, God, and then in their churches, their communities, and throughout this nation. Let us be able to rejoice, God, as we begin to see the changes that are coming as a result of our willingness to humble ourselves and pray and to turn from our wicked ways and to, God, to ask for your forgiveness. And we do ask for your forgiveness today. Thank you, Lord, that you're right here with us today, God, and that your hand is upon us. We glorify your holy name and we thank you, Lord. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.